Claudia, Claudia. Hi. 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 Good morning. Good afternoon. Happy Women's Day to all of you. And welcome to another Open Science FAPESP event. Um, let us start by inviting uh, Professor Zago FAPESP's president for the uh, initial words. Professor Zago. Okay, uh, good morning or good afternoon in uh, Europe. Uh, I wish to stress the opening compliment uh, to women scientists uh, all over the world and uh, welcome to this webinar of uh, Open Science FAPESP is one of the pioneer Latin American organizations uh, in defining policies and creating mechanisms to support open science. The scientific community, however, has not yet acknowledged completely and fully engaged in the defense of open science. Thus, uh, meetings such as this one are needed uh, to raise awareness among researchers and policymakers of policies and initiatives by FAPESP, by the European Commission and uh, the OECD to force open science and to keep pace with this worldwide movement, we need to define and continuously update policies and create mechanisms to implement and support them by rules, normalization, programs, actions, in many fields, including public information. I think that the recent COVID epidemics contributed to increase the visibility of science as a public asset. And uh, uh, science that in a very short period of time was able to mount an effective response to the disease and its spreading. It was also a period in which many of the assumptions and the premises of the open science were tested under strong stress. But this success was achieved by a joint action of the scientific community and the citizens. In this way, it became more evident that science is not something that should interest only to scientists. On the contrary, as many citizens as possible should have access to the information, including that information that is subjacent to the scientific activity. Uh, on the other hand, Scientists themselves are becoming more aware of the benefits that sharing data brings to their own research in terms of the strategies, planning, and bypassing bottlenecks. Thus, more and more open science is becoming a game, game, game for scientists 
for the funding agencies and for the society that supports them. This event is part of the FAPESP efforts towards promoting and supporting open science as a means to accelerate the scientific discovery and promote collaborative research. The panelists represent three institutions in Brazil and Europe that have long contributed to the movement. And I wish to thank them for organizing this panel. And I look forward to the seminar. Thank you, Claudia, is with you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zago. And now um, I'll introduce the first panelist. But before doing that, um, it's been remarked and pointed out to me that only there are only male scientists in the panel. And how come today of all days, uh, the Women's Day and with so many women scientists and, and I am responsible for uh, inviting the panelists, contacting them. How come I did that? I have two answers, okay, complementary answers. The first is that the two previous open science events at FAPES had only women in the panel. Okay, so this is a difference. And the second is that you are going to see that all the panelists are really wonderful and will contribute to our discussion. Uh, and, and that is what we really have to think about right now. Okay, so let me uh, start. I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Luis Eugenio Mello, FAPESP's scientific director. Professor Mello, to you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Zago. Thank you, our dear uh, guests. And uh, I would like uh, to start by, uh, again, stressing Claudia's uh, words. Uh, she's to blame on uh, having a, a, a only male panel, but uh, on, on FAPESP's behalf, our perspective is a broader perspective and, and should not be uh, taken from a single event, from the, the whole uh, of uh, the activities that uh, we carry on. Uh, as uh, today is, is uh, Women's Day and uh, was uh, just uh, learning from the United Nations uh, theme for uh, today's uh, 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 event uh, and which is on uh, gender equality for a sustainable tomorrow, which is again, uh, 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 I think a, a very interesting perspective uh, for all of us uh, to have. So we'll start by uh, sharing my uh, screen with uh, the presentation uh, that uh, you should all uh, be seeing by now and now in uh, full screen mode. So uh, as uh, the first uh, speaker on this uh, panel will uh, mention uh, not only some of the basics on open science, but also uh, what uh, are the uh, FAPES FAPESP's initiatives on this uh, topic. So the main uh, underlying uh, principle for uh, uh, a funding agency is uh, mainly that science is a, a public good, as already mentioned by Professor Zago. And even though uh, a number of uh, funding agencies are not uh, pu public funding agencies, they are private organizations, still the main uh, aim of uh, uh, the activity that we all carry, it's uh, on uh, uh, the intent of, ha of having it uh, made as a, a public good. And so the outputs of uh, publicly financed research, of course, are a public good, as well as uh, should be uh, those uh, funded by uh, uh, privately funded uh, agencies and must be made uh, public as soon as possible while of course respecting the principles of scientific ethics, privacy, security, and uh, as well as uh, protection of uh, intellectual property. 
there are a number of uh, important uh, concepts uh, and uh, you could all uh, read uh, what is uh, shown uh, there on the slide, but collaboration and sharing uh, under a number of contracts are the main uh, critical topics uh, that uh, we should consider. And as a funder, FAPES has long supported and fostered open science practices in the three dimensions uh, shown there, to establish policies, to support computational infrastructure, and to educate and train people. Uh, which uh, requires a cultural change. It's a, a place there as uh, the last topic, but I would say that it, it's a critical, very critical topic as this is uh, a change of uh, attitude that uh, must, be, must take place in our uh, community. Uh, FAPESP is a pioneer funder in South America in embracing, monitoring, and fostering open science as already mentioned by Professor Zago. Some of our initiatives and actions are being followed by other Brazilian funders and thereby propagating uh, the open science culture. Uh, to uh, implement uh, open science, of course, there is uh, the need of uh, computational infrastructure. And, and that is uh, uh, made uh, via institutional repositories containing uh, papers, data, software, even hardware. Uh, with uh, executable uh, in specifications. And, and this, uh, uh, it's, it's not easy because of course, it seems that uh, digital uh, information uh, would be uh, freely uh, deposited and would not uh, consume resources. But uh, even in the uh, computational space, resources are limited data. We're being overwhelmed by uh, data and, and, and then curating data and, and, and making data as uh, simple as possible. Uh, again, it is uh, one of the critical topics that uh, is present there. Despite uh, all of the hardware applications, the software, the code, the data, the publication documents, the critical step uh, on, on all of that is the people using it. Uh, either uh, being by how uh, people deposit the information, the data, or how uh, people would be able to retrieve the data because depending on how it is uh, coded and it, it's made uh, accessible, again, uh, this might uh, require either a specific uh, training. Uh, and, and again, it, it's uh, not uh, something that uh, simply uh, occurs uh, by uh, chance, but uh, it, it, there must be a, a concerted uh, effort uh, in order to bring uh, this uh, 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 to fruition. Uh, going back to FAPESP's uh, uh, perspectives on this, we have a, a code of a good scientific practice that uh, uh, was uh, originally published in 2005. And in, in that code, uh, one uh, may read that uh, on the recording, storage, and accessibility of data and information, after the results are published, the research records must be made available to other researchers who may want to verify the study's correctness or replicate or continue the study. Accessibility may only be limited for ethical or legal reasons. Despite this being uh, 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 enforced and in, in, in place uh, since 2005, we're still struggling in order to make it uh, really uh, a reality and making the repositories uh, a reality and, and having the researchers depositing uh, not only uh, the uh, papers or the theses that are uh, uh, awarded uh, out of the research that is conducted, but also the, the uh, raw data that uh, has uh, uh, generated uh, the papers uh, or thesis and, and so on. Again, going on, on our initiatives, uh, FAPESP has uh, uh, from the beginning supported uh, Cielo, which is a repository of open access journals. This started in 1998. So again, a, a pioneering effort on the uh, uh, world uh, level. Uh, and this started as FAPESP uh, uh, a having it as a research infrastructure project. Cielo uh, today uh, has 
uh, 380 uh, periodicals, 1 million unique downloads per month uh, 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 of a total of uh, 450,000 uh, articles. We have a network that comprises 16 countries, uh, 1,250 uh, journals uh, with uh, 51,000 new articles every year. And uh, today uh, we have Cielo data and Cielo open peer review in addition uh, to the uh, uh, journals that are all uh, open, sex, open access as mentioned. Uh, we have an open access policy that was published in 2019. And uh, uh, the, uh, in, 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 in that uh, policy, what uh, we state is that the complete texts of articles and other types of scientific communication originating in research projects fully or partially funded and published in international journals must be posted to institutional repositories of scientific papers in accordance with the open access policy of each journal. And we, we have uh, stated uh, more recently a maximum of 12 month embargo, which again uh, is to uh, move forward in this uh, 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 enforcing this uh, policy. Uh, to make this uh, a reality, we have again devised a network of institutional repositories of scientific papers uh, which was created in 2015, and it's managed by each university, and it's housed at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, we have uh, compulsory, compulsory uh, data managing, management uh, plans on our proposal submissions, uh, which is an average of 20,000 proposals uh, every year. And uh, we have uh, the second largest uh, DMT, DMP2 uh, user community uh, from Sao Paulo after the, Americans, uh, the American universities. The specific instructions for DMP for research centers uh, started in 2021. And we have uh, coordinated uh, the creation of a state network of open research data repositories of uh, all seven public universities with uh, 48 uh, campi over 200,000 researchers in 2019. Finally, uh, upon the uh, COVID pandemic, we started uh, an initiative which uh, is called COVID-19 Data Sharing uh, BR Data Repository, which was launched in June of 2020 and uh, has uh, data on 800,000 patients, demographic exams, with over 50 million exam uh, records. And that is again, all uh, raw data that uh, has been uh, curated for anonymity and, and uh, all of the uh, requirements uh, that uh, should be uh, in place. Uh, the open research uh, data repository network that uh, was mentioned uh, is uh, uh, a link that uh, uh, involves storage of the different universities in the state of Sao Paulo, Unicamp, UFSCar, UNESP, and so on. It is housed uh, at USP and uh, uh, it, it allows access of information uh, from uh, all around uh, uh, the globe. Uh, again, the COVID-19 initiative was built uh, on uh, this already existing initiative, which is therefore modular and extensible. Uh, this was uh, already mentioned, and uh, we have had uh, downloads for, from persons from 36 countries. We have had uh, a number of uh, papers that were uh, published. Uh, the uh, uh, repository has been cited uh, by uh, a number of uh, uh, different uh, researchers across the globe. And again, we're very proud in uh, initiating uh, this uh, repository in the uh, beginning uh, of the pandemic. So uh, with regard to open software and code, so far uh, we uh, only look uh, uh, to have that uh, on specific calls, but uh, we would like to uh, expand this uh, in the future. So uh, on, on those uh, specific calls, uh, open software and code uh, is to be made, uh, is to, uh, be made uh, publicly 
available under appropriate licenses. And FAPES is a member of the newly created Funders Forum on uh, uh, Research Software Alliance uh, Network. Again, speaking on our open research infrastructures, because all of that uh, depends on uh, not only on, on making data available, but on having inf research infrastructure available. Uh, we, we have created, uh, uh, we are one of the main uh, actors in creating internet in Brazil in 1988 uh, with the, the so-called academic network at Sao Paulo, which today has been uh, reformed in the uh, research and education network uh, in Sao Paulo. And uh, we are moving forward in expanding uh, this initiative. We have a multi-user uh, equipment initiative in which any equipment uh, above uh, $50,000, uh, when it is uh, installed, it must be installed in a shared use mode, shared user mode to allow scientists from other groups, nearby labs and so on, and, and even on internet uh, operated laboratories access. Uh, and one of uh, such examples is, uh, uh, is that of uh, spectrographers, but of course it encompasses uh, all areas of uh, research, not only on uh, life sciences, but on hard sciences and, and so on. Uh, we have, uh, again, uh, looking to uh, open science from the perspective of education and training for sharing. Uh, this is something that uh, we must uh, uh, develop because it's not uh, necessarily uh, present uh, from start. And again, uh, from sharing uh, instruments and equipment, from sharing publications, from sharing software simulations and models, uh, we may enable an, a system in which uh, students uh, may uh, be trained to use all of that uh, facility, all of those facilities in order to develop uh, their uh, activities. And so this uh, would go on uh, having science and having uh, open science as an enabler of collaboration without any barrier. Of course, there are a number of uh, challenges as uh, already uh, mentioned. This uh, requires uh, uh, electronic infrastructures. This uh, requires policies as already mentioned, which would uh, change uh, over time. And uh, combining uh, uh, all, all of that with, uh, uh, with both the uh, closed uh, systems that uh, are in, in place and will still be in place for a long time with the open systems that are in place is of course uh, a necessity. To conclude, there are a number of uh, questions uh, that uh, we, we still uh, have and, and uh, we, we specifically at FAPES uh, uh, look uh, at them it, and, 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 and they're placed there. So how can we, through open science, exploit new ways of creating knowledge and innovation through collaboration and sharing. How to propose and implement policies towards governance, considering diverse and complementary experiences and knowledge across the globe. How can we further collaborate with the European Commission, OECD and other organizations to better, to better support collaborative open research? And to conclude, I have to especially thank my colleagues, Claudia Medeiros and Eduardo Marques which uh, in, 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 uh, together lead uh, the FAPESP, uh, FAPESPS initiatives on the e-science space. And, and again, also Professor Zago in being a strong supporter for uh, all of the uh, e-science uh, and open science initiatives that uh, we do carry. So with that, uh, I conclude my presentation. Back to you, Claudia. Thank you very much. And um, we have a lot of people live, and I'd like to encourage everyone to send us questions at email escience at fapest.br. All of the questions will be answered either live or afterwards 
if we cannot answer every question live by email. And um, upon that note, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Carter Smith from the OECD. Thank you very much for coming all the way from Europe to be here with us this well, morning here. Okay, uh, the microphone is yours. Thanks, Claudia. And um, I think Professor Zargo and Dr. Mello have really set the scene. Um, I'm not sure that I'll really be tell, able to say a, a, a lot that, um, that you're not already aware of. It seems Brazil is all, already really um, sort of leading the way in terms of open science. Um, the challenge, is, as was said at the start, is to, to really go to the next step and, and implement, um, fully implement some of the things that we know need to be done. Um, so I'll say a little bit about what OECD is doing. Uh, in particular, I'll focus on the work of the Global Science Forum, which is something that I'm responsible for. The Global Science Forum is a science policy forum that brings together people from ministries from OECD countries. Also, Brazil is very active in the, the Global Science Forum. Um, so the first thing is, is open science itself. And, and what do we mean by open science? Um, and the first piece of work recently from, from OECD was this report in 2015 where open science was really about making sure the outputs of science were available for more research. Um, so making the outputs publicly available. Then in 2018, we, we came up with a more detailed framework for open science, where there was a shift to um, not just the outputs being made available publicly, but also the whole process of science engaging more with the public. Um, and I think that's, that's what we heard in the last presentation as well. Um, and so there were sort of three elements of open science, um, the access to publications, and I won't talk about that, access to research data, which is what I will focus on, but also there's a critical third element, which is citizen engagement, which I won't talk about, but hopefully we'll pick up in the discussion. So in terms of open science and data, uh, we've done a series of reports recently. I'll talk about three of these, um, but there's one on here that, that I won't say a lot about, but I would refer you to, which is a report on ethics for new forms of data for social and economic research. So this was about how to use social media data, for example, how to integrate that with administrative data and the ethical issues around that. Um, and if you're interested in that area, I would reference that report, um, have a look at it. Um, I'll also mention a little bit about what we've done recently in a workshop on COVID. And I would just say that all of this discussion around open data is also now affected by issues and concerns around integrity and security in the global research ecosystem. So who is appropriating the data? Who is using it? Concerns about interference from, from foreign uh, states in particular, but also non-state actors in the research process. So at the start of this year, OECD came out with a new recommendation on access to research data from public funding. A recommendation is soft law, all the OECD countries um, commit to implement the recommendation. Many other countries also sign up. Brazil is a signature to this recommendation. The recommendation built on an earlier recommendation from 2006, which defined broad principles like transparency and equity. But this recommendation defined seven key areas where action really needs to be taken. It's more about making open data a reality, if you like. And these areas are highlighted here. So governance issues, issues around the technical standards, incentives, responsibility and ownership. And then three areas that I'll focus on in this presentation. So infrastructures, 
international cooperation and human capital. The other notable thing about this recommendation compared with the 2006 one is that it also talks about open access to software, to algorithms, workflows, models, and software. And it's now seen as an integral part of the whole uh, open data um, initiative is that you also need the tools to, to use the data, to analyze the data. So starting with the infrastructure, um, one of the issues around the, the data, of course, is um, the amounts are increasing exponentially. Um, it costs money to make it open. Um, how do we support all of this? What are the business models for making research data publicly openly available? Um, and so we did some work, it was published in 2017, looking at the business models for data repositories. Um, and it's also linked to, we more recently, we had a workshop around research infrastructures in relation to COVID. And one of the issues that came through really strongly there was just the importance of these data repositories and of long-term investment in these data repositories in crises like COVID. You can't suddenly build a repository. You need to have something to start with. Um, so the objectives of this study on business models to look at revenue uh, sources and, and the business models, test those models, and make policy recommendations. So the, the critical part of this really is what do we mean by a business model? And it's thinking of a business model in a, in a much more holistic sense. So if you're thinking about a repository, uh, what stage of the life cycle is it? Are you starting the repository, which might be done on project funding? Are you in an operational longer term phase where it needs different types of funding? Who are the stakeholders? Um, who are the data suppliers, the data users, the funders, the policy people who might be interested? What is your value proposition for all those different audiences? What is your product mix? Are you just providing the data? Or are you providing services, analytical services, contract services? Um, what are the costs associated with them? Um, can they be funded differently to the data itself? Um, what are the drivers and how do they match to the revenue sources? So we're getting more and more data. Um, if your revenue is fixed and you have more data to deal with, how do you, how do you deal with that? How do you make things scalable? Uh, I'll say a little bit more about the revenue sources in the next slide. And then this issue of demonstrating value. So do we measure the impact of our repositories? Do we, do we have good indicators and measures um, can we make the economic case? Um, and how do we inform and educate about the importance of open data? And that's all part of a business model for a single data repository. You need to think about all of those issues. Going back to the funding streams. So we defined, I think in this study, we looked in detail at 40 different repositories, but then we also, uh, I think we looked at over 100 in all. And there were basically five main sources of funding. So structural funding, as so funding for a, for a research infrastructure, for example, from a funding agency, long-term commitment. Host or institutional funding from a university or public research uh, laboratory. Deposit fees, data access charges, and then a diversification of, of different revenue resources. The important message from this is that there were, there were pluses and minuses to, to each of these. So structural funding, for example, which is often seen as the ideal from a, a data manager's perspective, it's good and it, it's compatible with open data principles. It gives you some sort of longer term stability, but it's also pretty fixed. Um, it's not very flexible. And in a very dynamic environment, as we see at the moment with not only growing amounts of data, but growing demands for that data, structural funding alone has its limitations. If we take another option, for example, data access charges, um, there the funding reflects the value of the data you have. You know, it's a, it's a market mechanism. Um, 
and it could provide it as a market mechanism in principle, it could make things more efficient. On the downside, it's not really compatible with open data principles. Um, and so it's not compatible with fundamental mandates. And so as a general model for, for most repositories, it's not applicable, but it may be applicable for parts of the data in certain repositories. So normally we conclude, well, let's diversify the funding resources and, and have lots of different um, sources. And that's good up to a point, but also that can lead to mission drift. You can end up just chasing after the funding and, and forgetting what your core business is. And so it's really important in thinking about these funding sources to think about the, the positives and negatives of, of each one. So the recommendations from this work, we need to recognize that research data repositories are part of the infrastructure of open science. That means they need to be funded and considered as infrastructure. They need a strategic approach. Obviously they need clearly articulated business models. And that means I think the funders, when they ask for, when they have applications for funding for, for repositories, they should ask for the business model. What is the business model? And the complete business model, as, as I presented there. Um, sponsors, obviously, in the light of the business model, need to think about their role in funding. Um, we need to be aware that the policy is that we set the mandates that we give to repositories restrict the sort of funding that they can attract, as, as we heard with the different funding streams. It, it, if we mandate open access and that excludes certain types of funding. And there are opportunities for cost optimization. Um, one of the questions that, that people don't like to ask is actually how many repositories do we need and do we need all these repositories? Um, I think we heard in um, Dr. Mello's presentation, the, the idea of federation and portals. And I think that certainly is one important aspect of that optimization. Moving on then, the second piece of work we did was around international cooperation in relation to repositories. Here we looked at research data networks. Um, so looking at the, the principles and actions that can support open and sustainable international research data networks. This has become even more important in the light of what we've seen in, in COVID. So, here we looked at, um, I think, about 60 different international data networks in different domains with different, some of them were truly global, um, things like the world data system. Um, some of them were, were more local, but they, they were all local in, in terms of a region. Uh, we looked at some of the regional ones from Latin America. Um, and these are some of the findings. Um, so the ones that work, the networks that work, really engage with their users. The users are critical. Um, on paper, there are the many researchers and scientists put together proposals for networks that sound good on paper, cost a lot of money, um, but they haven't done the work, the market work, if you like, on who are the users. And in the end, the, the networks fail because of the users aren't there or the, the users aren't interested in the products that are being provided. Um, the biggest challenge is actually attitudes and policies across different countries, different policies relating to data. Um, different communities do need different data networks. The idea of just one mega network doesn't work. Different communities have different cultures of data sharing. For example, you know, in extreme, if we take physics and social sciences, um, they're, they're very different um, cultures of sharing data. The, the technical challenges are not to be underestimated, but actually the main challenges that came up in this were very much about human relationships and trust and, and different expectations from different people in different countries. And again, there's a need even for the network to, to maintain, to, to establish what is your business model. Again, thinking holistically about this business model, you know, who are the users, what are their requirements, and in a network context, that's, that's even more complex because in, in different countries, the requirements may be, for example, more capacity building rather than actual um, 
you know, high level tools to use the data, um, but all of those users need to be accounted for in the business model. So the recommendations from this work, um, across different domains, there are different senses of what open data is, and, and we need to, to work out common definitions across communities, uh, within countries and across countries, uh, as to what open data means in, in these different fields. Uh, on top of that, for much of the data, we need legal and ethical frameworks for sharing it. We, we see that very strongly, for example, in COVID, the, the cross-boundary, cross-national cross sharing is, is, is really complicated. Um, and, it, and it's blocked not by the technical issues, but by the policy and legal issues. The networks themselves need long-term strategic investment, and that's easier said than done. Uh, national funders fund national repositories and, and national infrastructure. It's not clear who funds the, the international, the, the, the glue that keeps these things together. Um, and again, we need business models for these networks. We need measures of success, and we need to monitor how these uh, networks are doing. They, they need to be able to, to make a case that they merit support. The third piece of work I'll talk about now is work we did on digital skills. So yes, we've got the repositories. We, we have the networks of repositories, but um, as came through strongly, the critical issue is actually the people. Um, so we did some work on uh, digital workforce capacity and skills for data intensive science. Um, just last week, we had a workshop on scientific advice in crises. And one of the things that came through repeatedly in that was data literacy, data literacy of scientists, of the public, of policymakers, data skills and data literacy um, are critical in, in uh, in the COVID crisis. So here we have the following questions. Uh, what do we know about digital workforce needs for data intensive science? And the short answer to that is actually, we don't know as much as uh, one might expect. Um, and what is needed to build the digitally skilled workforce? So digital skills um, in different fields of science, there are different perceptions of, of what is most important when it comes to digital skills. Here, I've highlighted physics and astronomy, for example, where for that community, advanced programming is seen as the critical issue. Um, so this was a survey of 10,000 scientific authors. Um, and this is the percentage of those who saw different skills as being important. In medical and health, in fact, advanced programming wasn't seen as very important. What was most important was data collection and curation. So in different fields, we have different needs. Um, we, we looked at some pretty complicated digital skills matrices, um, and it's a lot, a lot of work being done around digital skills for science. But again, thinking back to um, there's no one domain, uh, there's no one, um, one size fits all answer for, for different fields of, of science. Um, you know, in, in physics, for example, or parts of physics, um, the individual scientists may also be very skilled data scientists and um, able to do a, a lot of the data stewardship. In other areas, the, the active researchers may have much more limited digital skills. But what we defined was four areas, um, four skill areas that, that were important. So they were to do with software development, the data itself, the advising on the, the law and ethics, which in some areas is, is really important and actually in most areas is relevant. And then the actual conduct of research, so there's sort of uh, the data analysts. Um, and we defined four sort of um, prototypes, if you like, of, of um, professional profiles that, that fit across these areas. So data analysts, data stewards, research software engineers, and researchers. The critical thing is that in, in any research project or research team or research institution, you need to have all these different skills and you need to have 
normally you need to have people with these different profiles, but depending on the domain, the, the data steward may also be a researcher. Uh, the software engineer may also um, be a data analyst, et cetera. Um, but it's important to think, have you got all of these skills um, and the sort of people you need to deliver them in the different domains and different institutions? So in terms of um, what needs to be done then to, to build digital skills, um, so we need to define just what the skill needs are. Um, so we need to look at the skills and roles required in different contexts. And again, that might be at an institution. So in a university, how digitally skilled are you? What sort of services do you have? Do you have the people you need? Do you have people who know about the legal and ethical issues, for example? Or maybe at the level of a team, um, do you have the, the sort of skills you need? Or it could be at a national level. Um, what sort of skills do, does my science community have? Do we, where, where do we have gaps? And those sort of gap analysis, we couldn't find many examples of where they'd been done or where they'd been done well. Having defined the gaps, then uh, obviously there were training needs, uh, both for foundational skills and for, for higher level skills, and, and in particular, ongoing training. Some of this could fit into formal undergraduate uh, education, but a lot of it really because the field is developing so fast, uh, a lot of it has to be in ongoing training. Um, and so there's real issues about how that is supported. We need community development. So uh, defining new professional goals for trainers. A, a lot of the training we found was done pro bono, people spending a lot of time uh, developing courses, training people, but it's not really even in their job descriptions. Um, linked to that, we need to think about the career paths and reward structures. So if we're going to have a lot more research software engineers or data stewards, what are the career paths for them? How will they be judged? Uh, what are the reward structures for them? And then there are a lot of issues around enabling um, data intensive science. So other policies to support open science and research integrity. And, and we heard a lot about how that's already happening in Brazil. I'll just then quickly finish with a few messages around COVID. Uh, we had a workshop here um, in April um, on lessons learned from COVID and data. So a few lessons learned, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can only build on what you have. So what we build now for data infrastructure is critical when it comes to crises. The issues around data governance, there's a certain amount the research community can do with its own data, but there's also a lot of issues around data governance that are beyond the research community. And we need the science needs to engage with, with other sectors, uh, for example, the, the health sector um, to, to get in place the sort of governance that, that we need. And we need to include citizens uh, and data subjects in designing those governance mechanisms. That's come through very clearly from COVID. Uh, issues around health service, public health surveillance data, and how that aligns with research needs. How do, how do we align the, the administrative research data needs with the research needs and vice versa? Um, and the idea that actually we're, we're going in the right direction, um, and rather than one big new top-down new system, what we really need to do is encourage those who, who are already uh, moving in the right direction towards open uh, for data. Uh, so a sort of a, a coalition of the willing, bottom-up approach uh, encouraged with top-down policies. Um, there's real issues that we see in COVID in that um, we only know what we measure, but we know that we don't measure a lot. Um, so there's whole groups within most countries and whole countries across the globe where we have very little data and they are excluded from our policy development because our policy development is, is based on the statistics and data that we have. So we need to be much more inclusive when we think about our data systems. Um, Obviously, in COVID, we learned that there's limits to open data as well. When it comes to, to personal data, sensitive data, um, we, we need to uh, 
um, we need to treat that um, with a, appropriate um, care. At the same time, there's no reason why metadata shouldn't be open and fair. And in fact, all metadata should be open and fair. Um, we need to think in terms of how much diversity do we need? How many, for example, new COVID uh, genomics initiatives do we need as opposed to all going with the one central initiative? And, and there's a balance between diversity and innovation. And at some stage, uh, things need to be consolidated. I think what's important is that every time a, a new proposal comes in, the argument is made as to, as to why, why this is needed and why it can't be done with what already exists. Um, we need to think about the incentive system. Uh, that comes through strongly everywhere that, that we touch on open science and open data. The, the current incentives do, do not encourage uh, open data. Um, and then the fora like the Research Data Alliance, these, these global fora that, that bring communities together that really aren't very expensive, but as I said earlier on in relation to the research data networks, it's not clear where the funding for them will come from. They are really valuable. And for the small amount of funding that they require, it really would be a good investment from, from all the, the national funders to, to put a little bit of money towards. Them. Um, so I'll stop there. The, I, think the, um, I think the presentation will be made available. Um, yes. Yes, and there's links in it. There's links in, yeah. there's links in the presentation so, so people can get access to the original documents. Thank you, Cartage, uh, for this very interesting presentation. And um, I'd like now to introduce our third panelist, Michael Arantas from the European Commission. Thank you so much for your presence here in Brazil. The microphone and the stage are yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, inviting me to, to this event. Uh, I am from the European Commission's uh, Science Policy Unit. Uh, so it means that we uh, set the, the, the strategy, we set the orientation for our science policy. Uh, and at the same time, we are also in the European Commission, uh, a large research funder of, of various initiatives. So we are also um, setting the example uh, of implementing uh, our open science policy and of course, following up on that and, and feeding that back to policy making. Um, I um, was asked to first uh, explain why uh, uh, our science policy has a priority for uh, open science. Um, so maybe first I should say that, of course, I'm not the official spokesperson of the European Commission, so I, I, you know, it's not officially the position of the EC, but nevertheless, to us in the European Commission, open science is the priority for, for science policy uh, across Europe. Uh, for us, it means uh, sharing knowledge, sharing data, sharing the tools as early as uh, possible in the research process. So um, making uh, these outputs accessible, making them reusable, and doing that in uh, open cooperation with uh, other researchers uh, that uh, also increasingly come from different disciplines, but uh, also with industry, with public authorities, with end users, uh, citizens, and society at large. Why, why do we think it's important? Well, when you make knowledge and data accessible and uh, reusable, the process of research becomes more efficient. You accelerate discovery, you accelerate the uptake. Um, since you have, you have uh, basically a better organization of the resources and of the results, and you have a freer flow of information. Also, when you uh, make transparent not only the knowledge and the data, but also the tools in terms of the models that you use, the algorithms, the software that you use, uh, as well as the methodology in terms of workflows and, and protocols, the, the results uh, become more reliable. They become more robust, so of higher quality. 
and also results become more trusted because you uh, you become more open for scrutiny you set up better conditions for the reuse uh, it's easier to test reproducibility and replic uh, replicability so uh, more reliability and robustness of the results also when you uh, open up the science system, the research system for cooperation with uh, society, public authorities and new industry. So uh, what we also call the quadruple helix cooperation, uh, the research work becomes closer to socioeconomic needs, to socioeconomic values. You uh, also improve scientific literacy. So it, it has an educational element as well. So the system of research also becomes more trusted, which, which of course is, increase, is, is very important important. Uh, how is open science enabling this? Well, it lowers the barriers to, to societal involvement in research. It makes knowledge freely available to citizens. Uh, and it encourages more rigorous and inquisitive uh, approaches in, in the population. Um, also, it makes it more creative, you could uh, claim, because uh, the research process is uh, addressing more, more questions. There is the possibility to have more data into the process, more angles of analysis and more interoperability. So uh, cross-disciplinarity, more creativity in the system is also something that uh, open science uh, enables. Um, as um, the speakers before me also have remarked, the, the pandemic uh, has been really a, a highlight also of the importance of, of open science, which really has been at the center of, of our response, uh, enabling access uh, to and reuse of, of knowledge and data and infrastructure, not least, so that uh, we've been able to accelerate the, the response and, uh, and also in, increase the quality of, of this response. So indeed, if, if you look back at the past, uh, at the past two years, um, we have seen, for instance, a massive increase in preprints. We have seen more open access publications. Uh, we have seen more international initiatives where open science has been a precondition for engaging in, in these. But on the other hand, we have also seen, uh, and, and now that hopefully we're coming out of the pandemic, that uh, open access is still only very partial. It's not immediate. It's not uh, without restrictive licenses. Uh, most uh, open access papers do not make their underlying data available without restrictions. And, and those that do uh, are very often without clear licenses for, for how to reuse. Um, uh, we have seen in terms of infrastructure that uh, it has been uh, very, very difficult to combine heterogeneous data sets. Uh, data is not fully interoperable. They are not fully uh, reusable. Uh, we have seen the importance, as was also underlined uh, just now, of uh, having invested already in data infrastructure. But there are still many, many issues, in particular in terms of uh, interoperability, uh, sustainability of, of this uh, data infrastructure. So overall, you could say that the issues are not only uh, technical, they are also legal, structural. They depend to a large extent on, on national or even lower level on institutional po policies and, and rules that are in, in place. And, and this is why also on open science, we need to uh, uh, cooperate at uh, international uh, levels so that our researchers, our institutions have the infrastructure, have the tools in place to allow them to practice uh, open science. And very important as an underlying uh, condition for this to happen is that our researchers have the right incentives, the right rewards, the right motivation to engage in this uh, systemic movement of, of, uh, of uh, open science, as also has been remarked in the previous um, talks. It, it, we're talking about a cultural change where many elements need to come together. So it, it is a systemic movement towards this way of practicing um, science. What do we do uh, in the European Commission uh, with, uh, with our uh, uh, open science policy? Well. Uh, on one hand, we want to uh, improve the practice of undertaking uh, research. We have uh, an, a number of key principles, uh, immediate open access to publications, 
responsible research data management, uh, making data uh, fair, uh, encouraging the early sharing uh, of, of, of results, uh, ensuring that there is rigor in methodology, um, and also encouraging science society interaction where this, uh, where this add values. And to support these uh, principles, these practices, we need to have the proper enablers in, in, in place. I already mentioned the importance of motivation. So incentives and rewards to, to, uh, to do science in this way and the underlying uh, research assessment, both of individual researchers, uh, teams, institutions, but also research proposals, very important uh, enabler for open science. Uh, Cartridge touched on the need for, for skills development and the recognition of, of different uh, types of skills and for them to come together. Infrastructures, of course, and we uh, are working in Europe on the European Open Science Cloud. We are working in Europe also on um, the Open Research Europe publishing platform. Two examples of open science infrastructures that, uh, that we are putting in place. Uh, and we are also working on the legislative and regulatory framework because there are uh, many uh, directives, regulations in place on copyright legislation, on data legislation that need uh, as well, uh, if not to enable, and then at least to, to support and not hinder the practicing of, of open science. So this is visible in, in a number of um, uh, initiatives that we uh, currently are working on. We have the overall research policy, which is called the European Research Area Policy where we have enshrined uh, changes to research assessment. We have um, the further development of the European Open Science Cloud and also of our publishing platform and the legislative environment. And of course, also in terms of funding, um, the, the new Horizon Europe program that started last year and will last uh, uh, until 27, where very much we are setting the example of our open science policy and, and, and showing the lead in, in many aspects of, of our policy. So more in detail about what we require of, uh, of our beneficiaries under the Horizon Europe uh, program. First, we oblige our uh, participants that they ensure immediate, so no embargo, uh, open access via trusted repositories to peer reviewed scientific publications. We require also that they retain their uh, IPRs, at least those that are needed to comply with the open science requirements. And this includes also uh, regarding licensing, uh, of course. Um, we uh, require uh, also the metadata of the deposited uh, publications uh, that they are open under CC0 or an equivalent uh, license. In terms of uh, publishing venues, uh, our beneficiaries are able to publish wherever they want, but we only fund the fees that they have for publications in full open access publishing venues. So in hybrid journals, for instance, we do not reimburse the, their costs for, for publications. Again, to follow our uh, policy on, on open access. Uh, secondly, we require uh, that our grantees uh, establish and update a data management plan uh, where they show how they will manage in a responsible way the, the research data that they, that they collect or that they generate, uh, again, in line with the FAIR principles. They have to deposit the data in, in trusted repositories uh, and link these data to publications where, where, uh, where this is relevant. Um, uh, again, we operate uh, under the uh, principle as open as possible, as closed as uh, necessary. So it means that uh, our beneficiaries have to ensure open access as soon as possible under CC BY or CC0, uh, uh, unless, of course, they have any uh, uh, reasons not to do it, which uh, or, or any legitimate uh, interest or, or constraints. Um, uh, and finally, um, 
uh, a third requirement from our uh, beneficiaries is that they provide access to data and any other results that are needed to validate the conclusions of publications. So this is in support again for um, uh, the, the needs also to to have reproducible results and for other researchers to to validate that this is uh, indeed the case. So uh, th these are the mandatory uh, requirements for, for open access, open science that we set in our program. Uh, and then we also encourage a number of open science uh, practices in, in many of our uh, calls. Uh, the uh, encouragement of pre-registration of registered reports, sometimes preprints, uh, sometimes open sharing of data, so not only fair data, but also uh, open data. Access, open access, uh, not only to publications and data, but also to other uh, very important research outputs, software, models, uh, algorithms, workflows, protocols. Um, uh, and also in, in some topics, uh, we require the involvement of citizen groups, civil society, uh, end users, and that they are really involved also in, in co-creating uh, the, the, the research content. Um, I already talked about the need uh, to work on the underlying enabler. Uh, for open science, which is uh, our uh, current initiative on reforming uh, the research assessment system. Uh, we believe this is very, very important because the way we assess and so the way we incentivize and reward research projects, researchers, uh, research teams, research institutions is, is very essential for, for their motivation, for the way they behave. And so overall for, for the well-functioning of, of our research system. But uh, as, as we also know, uh, that the current uh, research assessment system very often uses uh, quite inappropriate and very narrow criteria and methods that are very often based on the quantity, quantity of, uh, of publications in, in journals with high journal impact factors. Uh, so they are used as proxies for quality, performance and impact. And uh, this is a very narrow uh, way of assessing uh, research and, and researchers. And we also know that uh, in, in most cases, the, the uh, assessment system does not reward open science practices uh, in terms of open collaboration, in terms of early knowledge and data uh, sharing, uh, which we know uh, leads to increased uh, quality, increased efficiency, increased trust in the results and, and in the system. So um, uh, we have also seen that uh, in particular uh, over the last decade, many research funders and, and research performers uh, have already taken steps to reform, but uh, still overall, uh, the, the, there's no critical mass. In many cases, uh, it, it stays with declarations, but real implementation and, and progress remains uh, slow and, and fragmented. As, as well, so so we in in the European Commission, to, together with the um, the, the uh, EU member states, we have taken the action to to facilitate and to speed up uh, uh, reform, which again is a, is a systems change. It's, it's a change in culture for how you assess research and and researchers. So we, we believe that uh, assessment of individual researchers should be made based uh, on on qualitative judgments. Of course, here peer review. Is, is very uh, central and only uh, in, in cases where this is really needed, you have to be supported by quantitative indicators and of course use them in a, in a responsible way. We should value very much the, the diversity of activities of researchers, the diversity of uh, research outputs much beyond publications. Uh, we should motivate collaboration with the society and, and industry um, and we should incentivize uh, knowledge and data sharing as, as early as possible uh, in the process and, and at all the stages. So now for um, uh, nearly a year now, we have consulted uh, various uh, stakeholders, research performers, research funders, uh, research assessment agencies, and we are now working uh, towards an agreement that would be signed by, by these stakeholders and, and their associations that uh, is sort of a coalition of the willing uh, that would uh, take the lead to um, experiment and pilot different ways of reforming the current research assessment system. 
so we we expect to have such a an agreement in place uh, by summer maybe early autumn which will include be not only a declaration, but uh, also include an implementation plan. So with milestones, timeframes, and so on, to translate these commitments into to real changes, effective changes. Uh, and, and, and we will also set up an experimenting uh, space, a safe space where uh, the different signatories can, uh, can pilot new methods and can learn from each other based also of evidence of, of uh, benefits and, and costs. Of course, we are also taking this uh, internationally uh, we're discussing uh, with dora uh, which started 10 years ago we are also in the group of the global research council uh, you have all seen of course that uh, unesco the unesco recommendation on open science also talks about uh, incentives and rewards and and this is an underlying motivation for for practicing uh, open science the European Open Science Cloud, a few words about that. Uh, here, our ambition is to uh, consolidate what you could call a, a science commons for our researchers so that they can uh, store, share, process, analyze, reuse data, uh, but also publication software models, workflows across disciplines and, and across borders. So what will um, this cloud, European Open Science Cloud do? It will federate data infrastructures in Europe. They will connect them to high-speed networks to, to high-performance computing facilities. It will allow to produce, uh, uh, to, to produce research outputs that are, if you like, fair by design. Uh, and it will offer in uh, overall uh, what we like to call a web of fair data and, and, and uh, services, both with generic services, user identity management, data access, data discovery, interoperability, but also specific services, uh, including per discipline for, for processing, for statistical analysis, for visualization. Um, so uh, we are uh, currently uh, committed to uh, put in more than 1 billion together with our stakeholders into this uh, endeavor over the, the, the next uh, seven years, uh, a commitment that uh, we have put in a, uh, as part of our program. And also uh, uh, that the research community uh, and our member states are, are willing to, to, to match. Again, internationally, we are working uh, with other parts of the world. We have the the, of course, international connection, mobilization of research outputs also from other parts of the world. We work uh, in the context of the RDA in initiated uh, Global Open Research Commons. We work also in the CoData uh, initiated Global Open Science Cloud. So here we're discussing with uh, international uh, partners also how we can arrive not only at a European science commons, but a, a global commons of science, uh, research, knowledge, uh, resources. That, of course, uh, is, is, is not straightforward. It needs agreed principles for how such a commons is governed in a transparent way. Uh, it needs sustainable, uh, interoperable infrastructure to support what we have today, which is uh, data-driven and, and, uh, and open science. Um, also, a few words about how we see um, the, fu the future of scholarly uh, communication. What, what uh, overall I would say here is that uh, our, our principle here is that uh, all published research outputs, I mean, at least from public funding and, and in Europe, must be made public uh, in a way that uh, ensures immediate open access. So the, the reading and the download should be free of charge to the end user and also uh, reuse uh, for scientific purposes. So the, 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 the license to, to facilitate the search, to facilitate the mining, the distribution of deriv derivative work. So uh, with full text and data mining rights, uh, mining rights is, is, uh, is, is a key principle. Uh, also publications should include data and code availability as, as a statement. So where do you go? How do you seek permission for, for uh, having access to, to this data? So in other words, the public should not pay first for the research, second for the publishing of the results, and third for access to the results. Uh, the research results should be 
made open to all without any embargo and, and licensed in a way which facilitates uh, uh, reuse. Now, this is not the case today. We have paywalls, we have embargoes, uh, researchers uh, hand over their IPRs. Uh, there's a lack of control and transparency of, of the research process and, and the outputs. So um, instead, as I said, uh, we see a scholarly communication system where there's immediate open access and ease of reuse for all. There's transparency in the process, such as open peer review. Uh, the researchers and their institutions should be empowered to manage their data and their IPs appropriately, uh, and they should be supported by, by the uh, appropriate open science uh, infrastructure. Of course, here I'm also touching on uh, a system that needs to be affordable, that needs to be equitable. Um, uh, we, we know that uh, this is an issue. Open science is, uh, has a cost. It's, 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 it's resource intensive in terms of infrastructure, in terms of support, in terms of uh, uh, training. So we need to work with uh, different models also of, of, of a scholarly uh, communication. We need to know that openness have different meanings in different uh, disciplines. Um, on our side, we support uh, many different models. We support APC-based uh, article processing uh, charges uh, publishing models. We also support non-APC-based, so the, the non-for-profit uh, scientific community-driven institutional infrastructures or repositories. Um, I will, um, on the next slide, show you our own uh, Open Research Europe publishing platform um, as an example of how we are taking uh, our own steps in that direction as well. Um, as I said already, uh, uh, program-wise, we also uh, walk the talk. So we have different kinds of policy support actions in place. Uh, one that we will be launching this spring which is supporting capacity building for institutional open access uh, publishing across Europe. Um, and uh, we will also be launching uh, probably in the next um, uh, calls, uh, 23 or 24 at the very latest, some global cooperation in uh, non-for-profit uh, open access uh, publishing, where we are trying with this action to help coordinate among institutional non-for-profit open access publishing initiatives in Europe and in other areas of the world, uh, uh, at least at the non-technical technological level to exchange uh, experiences, sharing best practices on issues like open peer review, early sharing of results, post-publication peer review models and, and so on. Um, in particular with, uh, with Latin America, uh, of course, including with Brazil, we have overall, um, uh, an action plan on, on science, technology, and innovation. There is a part focusing on open science. We also have uh, recently set up um, under our policy dialogue support facility an action on open access where we, uh, amongst other things, will have comparative studies of this kind of publishing models in Europe and in uh, Latin America. Finally, as I promised, um, one slide on um, the Open Research Europe um, publishing platform, which is the European Commission's um, uh, initiative. It uh, supplements the options that our program beneficiaries have to publish their results in immediate open access. It has no cost to them. And by doing so, they will know that they're in full compliance with their contractual obligations. So the, the, the platform is based on a post-publication peer review models. So uh, the submitted articles are published immediately and then they undergo an, an open peer review process. We have uh, seen uh, quite some uptake of, uh, if you look at other similar platforms, uh, of, of uh, uh, funders, uh, you will see that uh, for one year to have nearly 200 publications is, is not a bad result. It might not seem like a lot, but uh, we believe it's, it's, it's a good start. Our ambition goes beyond the, the current status of the platform. We, we want to, again, take the lead uh, or show the lead in operationalizing open science uh, principles within scientific publishing. So open, 
uh, rigorous, transparent peer review, uh, early sharing of research results through preprints. And of course, the post-publication peer review model is, is another form of early sharing. Uh, we are also working on a new generation of indicators where we have the metrics at the article level. The, uh, the costs that are associated with uh, each article is, uh, is, is relatively low, it's around 800 euros per article. And uh, uh, on the midterm, we are also exploring how we can collaborate on this platform, uh, this publishing platform with other funders, so to extend the scope of, of the platform. So with this, um, I hope uh, that uh, you have um, now gotten an impression of why we at the European Commission think open science uh, is a priority for our science policy, why it is so increasingly, uh, considering the, the last two years of the pandemic, how we are committed to open science, both in terms of our policies on reforming research assessment, open access, fair data, uh, open cooperation, um, our investment in the Horizon Europe program, 100 billion over the next seven years, our support to infrastructure. And of course, for all of these issues, the importance for us of the international dimension, be it bilateral, bi-regional, or indeed multilateral, be it UNESCO, OECD, RDA, or others. Thank you. Uh Thank you very much, Michael, for uh, ending with such interesting facts and priorities. And uh, the, the last uh, presentation of, of the panel, and now I'd like to ask everyone to open their uh, cameras. We are receiving lots of questions. And again, questions by email to eScience at fapest.br. So uh, we are going to answer as many as possible live, and then everyone will receive, uh, those who we are not able to answer, will receive answers by email afterwards. Okay, so um, I'd like to start with uh, Professor Roberto Arruda, who with me coordinates FAPESP open science initiatives and policies. And uh, Ahuda, please, uh, you will ask the first question. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks uh, to all the speakers for the very informative talks. Uh, one first question from the audience came from a CEO of a small company, Mr. Moacir Lacerda. Uh, and he asks, uh, how do you see the participation of private companies in this uh, repository and sharing data and software efforts? So uh, anyone I suggest, uh, can contribute? Yeah, I suggest the, the, yeah, the three uh, panelists could uh, comment on their view on this uh, private company participation. Um, I, I can start off if you like, Roberto. Um, I think it's a good Please question. Um, I think it's important not to divide the world into public and private. Public is good, open access, private is bad profit. Um, I think there's a really important role for, for private companies. There's a huge amount of expertise in the private sector. Um, there's a huge amount of data. Um, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of people who both would benefit from um, from open access and uh, can input to it. So specifically with regard to repositories, you know, in the work we did, we looked at some repositories that were based that essentially were private companies. I confess there is some concern about some of those um, that. Um, there's, there's concern that um, data will end up being locked up, that it may be accessible to the users, but institutions, for example, will have to pay so that the 
people can deposit in those repositories. So there are some concerns, and I think it's important to look carefully um, at some of those models. But then there's other areas where, um, for example, for specialist services on top of data, where private companies, there's a huge potential for them. Um, there's a lot of private companies who want um, particular access, uh, particular things done with data, and that can be done by intermediaries who are private as well. So I, I think there's a critical goal for the private sector and there needs to be a discussion with, with the private sector and private companies. But we also need to be very careful not to get locked into something that initially looks, looks attractive because all the data will be taken care of by the private sector. And then once you're locked in, you can't get out of it. And uh, what looked like a a relatively affordable model suddenly becomes something that is, that is much more, much less affordable in the long term. Thank you, Carthage. Michael, do you want to comment, please? Yes, absolutely. No, I agree with Carthage. Uh, we should not forget that, uh, uh, at least in Europe, uh, two thirds of the research investments are done by private uh, funds. Uh, and certainly, uh, they uh, have uh, benefits to, to participate. Now, of course, since they're private, we cannot force them to do it. Uh, so what we can do on our side uh, is that uh, we can start working um, on, the, on the public research. So for instance, if you take the European Open Science Cloud, it's clear that this is EU and publicly owned. But the private sector, of course, are welcome also to deposit the data, to, to reuse the data. What we can do also from a public point of view uh, is to point also to them, uh, their interest in contributing services. So on top of the data repository, you have services and uh, uh, these will also be supplied by the private sector. And then the third point I want to make is that uh, there are certain uh, emergency situations uh, where uh, we could also demand privately held data sets to be included under certain conditions, of course. And, and, and this is why also the, the uh, data legislative and regulatory framework uh, is important. Thank you, Michael. Do you want to comment, uh, Luis? Thanks. I, I do agree that there is both uh, the perspective of uh, uh, who will deposit and who will have access uh, to it. Uh, data, of course, uh, has uh, value. Uh, the uh, access uh, to the information that uh, will be deposited, uh, there might be uh, restrictions uh, around that, but uh, we should not uh, by any means uh, uh, make this uh, divorce between uh, private and, and public. And, and of course, uh, it, it should be all uh, be uh, considered as uh, potentially uh, uh, relevant and, and including the same uh, platforms, but uh, likely would uh, require different uh, uh, regulations. Uh, I'd just like to Sorry. compliment, if I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But just to point out an example of different ways in which private and, and public can help each other to help science. And that is an example uh, Louise mentioned of the COVID data sharing repository uh, at FAPESP in which we have a huge amount of data coming from private health institutions to help uh, but, and it's all open to help the access to knowledge and innovation. Okay, so there are different models and um, of course, different constraints. I don't know, I thought someone else was going uh, otherwise because we have so many questions. I'd like to continue with the next uh, person, uh, Eduardo Marques who is my colleague in coordinating the FAPES program in science and data science will ask the next question. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. F thanks a lot for the presenters. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I have a, a question from uh, Viridiana Campos, who is a researcher 
at the Center for Studies of Violence at USP, who politely remarks uh, the restriction. Actually, I'm, I'm translating and transliterating her question, but uh, she uh, politely remarks the, the restriction that the use of a single language, which is English, uh, poses to the, the openness of uh, knowledge production. Uh, not only in the nationalistic uh, decolonizing sense, but also in the social uh, sense, uh, considering the level of knowledge uh, of, the, of the language in a country such as Brazil. Uh, I don't know uh, whom, uh, Luis? Thanks. Uh, I, I do agree. I do remember uh, when I was uh, a, a child, an adolescent, and uh, uh, there was uh, someone uh, trying to, uh, let's say, motivate motivate the students uh, to learn. Uh, I, I forgot the name of the language, uh, uh, international language that was to become the in, the, the international language of the world, mixing words and uh, let's say grammatical rules from the different languages and, and so on. Esperanto. Thank you. It didn't catch. I mean, uh, but there has been a number of uh, uh, tries in, in the past. Of course, uh, nowadays, uh, English is the lingua fran franca of science uh, in the world. In the past, uh, for a while, it was French, uh, German uh, uh, raised uh, in some points. Uh, of course, the Chinese uh, may uh, try to raise uh, Mandarin. And that uh, has to do with uh, a number of uh, different uh, aspects. Of course, again, as uh, we move forward, it may be possible that uh, different uh, softwares will enable immediate translation uh, as in science uh, fiction movies. Uh, there are, uh, of course, barriers uh, for me, but I think I, I speak English fluently, but it, it has no match with how well I can explain myself and express myself if I'm using Portuguese. Of course, it's a barrier. Uh, but it's a barrier, and, and there is no simple solution for that. Uh, again, having this uh, seminar in English allows us to talk to uh, uh, listeners around the globe. If we're having it in Portuguese, uh, we wouldn't have uh, neither Michael nor Carthage being able to uh, interact in the same way as we're doing. Uh, so uh, I, it, it's just to say I have no answer. <laughs> I, I just uh, see what's the current uh, status. Uh, it, it's not easy, but it's what uh, we have to uh, work with. If, if I may comment on this as well, uh, because in Europe we have many languages. So <laughs> multilingualism is, uh, is, is, is really also an issue for us. What we have to do as, uh, as policymakers, as uh, program managers as well, is to ensure as much as possible that it doesn't involve biases. Um, we, we, we can do it in terms of uh, training, raising awareness, uh, for instance, training our evaluators to look at the true value of the content of the research and not be disturbed by the way it is expressed or formulated because some people are better at English than, than others. We can offer them tools, for instance, translation tools. So th there are a number of things we can do in terms of avoiding that uh, it becomes a bias if, if you don't uh, master uh, the, the, the common scientific language in, in the proper way. Uh, I think I'll continue because we still have lots of questions. And actually the next question um, is related to this one um, from Deborah Chadi from USP. Since people are key for this process, I'd like to know how we can deal with the cultural change we need to really advance open science, uh, especially considering initiatives and rewards. And um, just in parallel talking about multilingualism, which is what, also part of, you know, accommodating different languages and cultures, a huge uh, set of initiatives is being conducted in Africa because there the, the number of different languages per country is also being uh, considered in open science initiatives. So I'd like to ask the three of you about 
cultural changes and rewards and what can be done about that. Not cultural changes, culture changes, I'm sorry. Um, should I start off then, Claudia? Yeah, please yeah. do. Um, so I think um, this is the, the really critical issue and it's not actually just about open science. It's about, for example, more transdisciplinary research and uh, many things that are happening in, in science. So we have a system that basically um, judges individuals in terms of what we call excellence, which is defined by the single measure of um, bibliometric performance. Um, and we're moving to a system where we'll have much bigger teams, we want many different outputs from science and we want open science. And so there's a complete disconnect between the, the way we judge science and what we want out of it. Um, and there's a role for many different actors in this. So part of the problem is academia itself. The number of times I've sat on committees where people, one item they discuss, yes, yes, we need new measures, we, we, we should... Um, get rid of bibliometrics. The next item, they're, they're judging someone's CV and they say, oh, but have you seen the H index? They're not good enough. And so there's this schizophrenia amongst the academic community and the way they judge their peers is on their publication performance and uniquely on their publication performance. And so there's a role for the academic community. There's absolutely a role for employers, whether they are universities or public research organizations and the sort of promotion and recruitment criteria that they use, whether they, whatever they have written down, how it actually operates in practice when they're in committee is, is the critical issue. Um, that also bring, brings in issues around gender bias as, as it's uh, gender day today, there's, there's real issues there. And there's a role for the funders in terms of how they judge proposals, the sort of criteria they use, but I don't think the funders are the main problem here. I, I think all these different actors have to work together. Um, and for me at, at the moment, the real issue is the senior, many of the senior scientists, many of the people who have established positions, who've got them that way and who don't see why it should change. Um, yeah. I'll leave it there. So this Very question is... Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, can please, Michael, go ahead. Sure, I'm sorry, sorry, I thought that. Well, you're the moderator, Claudia, so you you, <laughs> you have the control. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> this is really uh, the, the essence, you know, changing okay. people. Right, so uh, indeed, it's a very good question. Uh, when we talk about culture, when we talk about people at the center, uh, it's, it's really a systemic uh, movement, which is uh, required, as I said before, many elements need to come together. Um, uh, it's the, the, the approach that we take for reforming research assessment uh, is exactly one where we want to put the researcher uh, in the lead. We uh, want to take particular care of early career researchers because they have most to gain. What Curtis is saying is true about the uh, more senior researchers, but not all of them. Many of them also want to see a reform of, of uh, research assessment. What is very important also is that the, the, the many different stakeholders come together, both those that research, uh, assess research proposals, those that determine whether to hire or promote a researcher, uh, those that uh, uh, grade, assess research institutions and teams. Why is this important? It's because uh, we, we uh, want to have a coherent system that has uh, no contradiction so that uh, the individual researcher is not squeezed between the criteria and the processes that are used to assess, assess at the institutional level, so by his, his or her institute, uh, and the criteria used by the government, for instance, to allocate funds to institutions. If there is incoherence, contradiction between the two, the researcher is squeezed between how to write a proposal to this 
uh, uh, program and how to promote her or, or his career. So the no contradiction in the different research assessment system is, is very important um, and, and uh, getting all the stakeholders uh, around the table for a culture change is, uh, is key for, for, for this to, to happen. Uh, if I may, down here in Brazil, of course, we have a system that uh, would uh, be different uh, from the European system, given that uh, despite uh, the different uh, uh, ways uh, 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 how the researchers are hired by our academic institutions, uh, almost always is, is, uh, is a, a system uh, which is likely uh, your tenured from start. So there is uh, no such uh, uh, ongoing evaluation, which is very bad, as I see, but uh, it is uh, how it is. And, and then uh, from the FAPES perspective, we, we were uh, moving forward in, in trying to uh, uh, use, for instance, uh, 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 a CV description, which highlights the three main publications rather than host uh, range, whole range of uh, publications. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, explicitly requested uh, evaluators, uh, 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 reviewers, as well uh, as uh, proponents uh, to express whether or not they had uh, any uh, familiar, uh, let's say aspects such as a child uh, that uh, they had to take care of, and that uh, of course uh, most uh, often more often uh, 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 falls on, on the uh, responsibility of uh, women, but also uh, elders that uh, may, they, they may have uh, again taken care. And again, this is to avoid uh, gender bias. Uh, but uh, as uh, Cartage was saying, it's often you have a set of uh, definitions that you have uh, put in place and then people are looking to age index or uh, whatever higher profile publications uh, they had. And, and so it's a system that we must uh, continually uh, reinforce and, and, and stress that uh, we, we should look to quality, not quantity, and we look to uh, other uh, aspects as well. Again, as we looked uh, internally to what uh, we were uh, granting to who, whom we were uh, uh, awarding grants. We were trying to devise uh, systems that uh, allow uh, <clears throat> younger researchers uh, to uh, present proposals. We have even launched uh, this uh, month, uh, past month, uh, a new call for proposals, which is for very young scientists. And, and that uh, call uh, looks much less to the uh, CV and much more to the project. And that's clearly stated, it's the new generation uh, 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 research grants that we have uh, launched. But uh, it, it's not easy, it's a cultural change, it takes time. And, and I do agree that uh, th there must be an understanding between the different agencies. In Brazil, much of the system has been shaped by CAPES, uh, the main uh, funding agency regulating uh, 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 postgraduate uh, uh, graduate studies, and and uh, they they have a set of rules, even uh, standardizing uh, where a publication is on a qualis index, which again uh, contributed a lot uh, to improving quality, but uh, damaged a lot in in shaping this uh, numerology uh, 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 much uh, over uh, from where it should have been. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'd still like to cover a couple more questions. Yeah. And um, I'd like now to ask Ahuda for uh, the next question, please. Yeah, this is a question uh, not coming from this audience today, but from a colleague uh, working in uh, life sciences. And she expressed her concerns about uh, sharing data in, in for the what does it mean for the global south countries? Because uh, of course the global north countries with more tradition in science, they will be quicker and more efficient in using that data. 
So if uh, a global South country generates data, it's probably likely to be more valuable or use it more quickly by, by developed countries. So could you comment on this concern that was expressed? Uh, maybe Michael and uh, and Hartich. Michael? Um, yes. Um, I mean, overall, if you look at uh, uh, the amount of data sets uh, available, uh, the, the Global North has relatively a larger amount uh, than the Global South. So opening the data is relatively more beneficial to the Global South. <laughs> as well. So you, you also have to look at it in, in this way that pushing for fair and open data, uh, making the reuse of data produced wherever, in, in, if it's produced in the global north and the global south, is beneficial um, uh, relatively more to the global south. So uh, then there is also the question uh, of the, the, the costs that you have. The, the infrastructures, the tools that you have at your disposal uh, to, to make your data fair, to share your data. But here we're talking about capacity building and having the right uh, open science infrastructures in place, uh, which indeed uh, is an issue. And it's also an issue for, for us in the global north because uh, we know that we're missing many, many valuable partnerships and collaborations with, with the global south. Thank you, Michael. I, I fully agree with you. It was good. I hope she's hearing. Uh, yeah. So, so just to, to add to that, um, I think this is a real issue. Um, I think it's a really important issue. Who who actually appropriates the data? Who can use it? We see it in COVID. We we saw it with the South African data. Um, it was a slightly different context, but it, there it was about political decision making using African data because they'd made it open. Um, I think, um, so there's no very simple solution, um, but we should get away from the fact that if all data is open, everyone can equally profit from it. That's not the reality. Some countries will more than others, some institutions will more than others. As we now get into AI and high-performance computing requirements, it'll become even more biased towards certain institutions. That's the reality. And so when we talk about things like reciprocity or mutual benefit, we really have to embed equity into that. Mm -hmm. And we really have to think about what does it mean for, for all the partners, if you like, for all those engaged. And I think it means there's an obligation on those in the OECD countries to, to support capacity building in, in digital skills, et cetera, mm -hmm. to support the, uh, the infrastructure that is required for, for data, for, for research um, in other countries. Um, and even if the, the amount of data may be more from the North and the South, you know, that may change as soon as we have the SKA, which is based in the South, or you know, it, it's not about amounts. Um, you know, there's really, really valuable data in the, in the South that is, um, that is used essentially in the North. And so I think we need to think very carefully um, about this. And it, it's, uh, it, it's not a, a simple issue, um, but I think it, it, there's a real goal for the global community. We saw it in our work, the, the work we did on research data networks, what they want in the South, I say the South, that's a, you know, it's not just the South, but if, we like, if you like the lesser developed countries, really they join the networks because they want capacity building. They want help. Whereas um, those in the North, what they want is access to the data. But those two things can work together and we have to build those sort of networks and get them to work together so that everyone gets out of it what they most need. And in the end, we have some equity built into the, the openness. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. I'm sorry. Very complimentary. Yeah, yes. yeah yes, I'm Catherine. sorry. I, 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 have, I just have to tell everyone that since we have uh, still another um, big question coming from many people, 
Um, we are going to extend for 10 minutes this webinar, okay? So I don't know if um, Luis would like to comment or Ahuda or yes. otherwise we'll go to the very last question. Uh, I, I would just, uh, to me, this uh, reminds me of a situation in which uh, the uh, people on the biodiversity uh, and uh, other uh, areas of knowledge uh, have dealt. And it, uh, I, I remit this to the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing. The Nagoya Protocol on Access to Genetic Resources and the Fair and Equitable Sharing of Benefits arising from their utilization to the Convention on Biological Diversity. So th there is uh, some uh, analogy and, and uh, definitely there are ways uh, we should uh, uh, or, or we could uh, use. And, and the perspective that Michael brought is, is uh, quite uh, important. It, it's uh, both ways and, and the amount of data that's being deposited by the more developed countries it's immense as compared to the amount of data that we're depositing. If we look from a country's perspective in terms of development, I will mention, I will name two countries, uh, which again, uh, to my, uh, the, during my lifetime, uh, when I was a child, Japan was seen as just a copycat. Japan was copying everything from uh, uh, other countries and, and people were looking uh, not happily at that. But over time, Japan evolved and, and developed its own infrastructure, its own capacity of generating a patents and idea and, and not copying and so on. So this uh, movement uh, seems to be a natural movement uh, over time. And then again, benefiting from what others have created, what others have processed, it's on benefit of uh, any developing country. So fr from this perspective, again, uh, I, I would say that uh, th there are many sides that uh, one uh, can, can look. And, and again, uh, th this should be, uh, uh, th there are ways uh, that uh, current uh, society are, are, dwelling, uh, are dealing with uh, this, such as, again, the Nagoya Protocol. Uh, thank you. I know I said that we should run, but I do like to compliment because I'm a data researcher, that we should think that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, okay? And in the South, we can have the contribution of different kinds of interpretation of the same kind of data, actually, no matter what volume, that researchers in the North might not be able to see. So this is, has also to be taken into consideration. Um, and now I will ask Eduardo and myself to read the last set of questions, which concern open access. Eduardo, please. Well, uh, actually, uh, it's a, uh, I'm going to read the, the question. I think actually several of these questions uh, tackle or uh, try to discuss the same kind of uh, uh, preoccupation associated with inequalities. And this is another one, uh, the inequalities of of uh, publication and uh, of consumption of articles that uh, different tools of open access can produce. So the question is, over the last years, mainly 2021, a staggering number of journals have migrated to an open access model to comply with Plan X and publishing fees have escalated to a point of being prohibitive uh, for most Brazilian researchers. Uh, FAPESP, uh, in a way, solved this uh, a long time ago, uh, uh, managing to support Cielo uh, uh, in Brazil. How much does this cost and why this is not used uh, as a model worldwide? This is a question uh, by uh, Sabine Pompea from UNIFESP. Uh, thank you. And I'll just compliment with the questions from, among others, uh, Alicia Kowaltowski and uh, Sabine Pompeia, several questions on the same topic, um, and Dora. And I mean, I mean, Dora, the person, okay? Um, and Maria Elena Goldman from, from USP. I'm sorry, I cannot find Dora's surname. So they all concern how to make APC, article processing charge, 
compatible with open science. Um, plan S, uh, is the European Commission overseeing prices for open access article publishing. Uh, APC have, are known to have increased well over inflation. And how are developing countries to uh, kind of compete and how can they do publish without being excluded by excessive APC costs? And there, um, we um, are going to answer afterwards if any of you who ask questions on APC and open access do not feel contemplated by the collective answers. Please email me and I'll forward your questions to the panelists. So sorry. Uh, so please, uh, all of you, uh, start answering. Uh, I, I can start um, <laughs> clarifying that the European Commission does not oversee uh, APCs. Uh, I can also clarify what is our link to Plan S. So we are uh, uh, we are aligning our program. So we are there as a funder as well. We are support of Plan S. We are aligning our program, so Horizon Europe, with uh, Plan S because we have the same core objective. We we support. Uh, full and immediate open access to, to scientific publications. But there are some differences as well. <clears throat> In our program, we require open access via repositories. We, uh, we also include books and, and monographs, not only um, uh, articles. Um, and we uh, do not reimburse publications in hybrid uh, journals, even even when they are covered by uh, uh, transformative agreements. So th that's just two points of, of clarification. Um, for us, we support, I mean, the European Commission and our open science policy, we support open access publishing, both the model which is APC based and the model that is non-APC based. How? how what do I mean by that? Well, we support those that are APC based because we consider these costs as eligible costs. And so we reimburse our beneficiaries. We say you can publish wherever you want, but we only reimburse, of course, in venues that are full open access. <clears throat> uh, we also support the non APC based. So I mentioned a couple of actions that we are doing in terms of capacity building at various institutions across Europe, which is already taking off this year. And another one that we have in the pipeline, which is global cooperation on diamond publishing, uh, where we want to tackle uh, both in Europe, but also internationally, uh, various issues that have to do with technical capacity for offering uh, diamond uh, uh, publishing uh, standards, the tools that are needed. So this is uh, one set of, of challenges that we want to tackle. The other one is uh, sustainability and uh, what Carter said with the business models for, for, diamond, um, for diamond publishing and everything that has to do with managing such a publication uh, venue and, and the marketing and so on that, that goes with it. So we're supportive, uh, as I said, both APC-based and non-APC-based uh, publication models. So just to... Just to add a, a little bit to that, and uh, um, I, as you saw, I didn't um, present anything really around publications, um, but um, I think it's fair to say that the whole of scientific publishing is in transition, and we don't know at the moment exactly where it will end up. And there's gonna be some painful moments for some of us in that transition. Um, and this question of, where, where do you actually um, put the charges up front um, to, the, to the person who's, uh, to the author, if you like, to the people who are publishing, or at the other end, to those who want access to the publications, has always been there. Um, and it's, it's now, you know, it's becoming very evident that it, it, um, it can be a barrier in different places. It plays out differently. Um, I think if you... If you look carefully at some of what the commission is doing, you can see where the, potentially where the future is. Um, 
And the again, part of this is about the current culture, uh, where the insistence um, from from our peers is that everything is published in very high impact journals, and they tend not to be the ones that have reasonable APCs or full open access, etc. Um, and we have to shift away from that if we really want to shift the the model. Um, and I think things like uh, what has been done in Brazil with, with Sayelo, et cetera, are um, good transition arrangements, if you like. They're good models um, that, that can help us on the path to whatever, wherever we end up the new publishing model. You know, I think also in COVID, we've seen a lot more uh, preprint publishing in domains where we wouldn't have expected it. Uh, we're seeing some of the pluses and minuses of that. Um, and I, I think we, it's not clear where we'll come out of this, but there are different uh, scenarios that I think have been presented, um, and none of them involve high APCs continually being paid out of public funding. So from uh, FAPES perspective, I would like to remember that uh, Brazil accounts roughly for from for two percent of uh, the world uh, output in terms of uh, science production, and if you go down to the state of São Paulo, we're a, a fraction of that. So Brazil is is a minor player in a world with many big players, and we we try to align uh, our movements uh, with uh, what's uh, being discussed at the Global Research Council. Uh, we we uh, just uh, this week uh, have uh, uh, emailed uh, the Global Research Council and Coalition S regarding specifically APCs. So we're uh, carefully looking at the situation. We're uh, trying to position ourselves in alignment uh, with uh, what's uh, being developed uh, elsewhere in Europe or United States and uh, other institutions elsewhere. Uh, and, and as remembered uh, by Carthage, uh, we, we have uh, a, a long tradition which was uh, pioneered uh, in 1998 or whatever uh, it, with the Cielo, which it, again, it, it's, it, it's a very interesting initiative, but it also has uh, its problems. FAPESP is currently uh, responsible for 90% of the funding of Cielo. And, and, and this should be uh, and, and it's an initiative which has 16 countries, not only Brazil, despite Brazil being the largest uh, player. And, and Sao Paulo, again, it's a small portion of Brazil, but FAPESP uh, re is responsible for 90% of the funding. Uh, so again, it, it must be uh, looked also from the uh, sus sustainability in the financial, uh, economical aspect of the initiative. We're all talking about uh, cost. We all are aware that uh, the current model seems to be in a, a tr transition mode. Uh, and uh, we, we are aware of that. That's uh, what uh, I think uh, I have to say at this point. OK, um, so that was the last question we were able, or set of questions, to convey. Um, I'd like to finish, because of the time, um, thanking, first of all, the panelists and my co-moderators for, for all the, the wonderful things we learned today. And uh, of course, the, all, all the people who sent their questions and all of those who are going to watch the YouTube video in the future and also learn from it. And to all of those who have been here and to all of those who will listen to the video afterwards, I have a secret message, okay? Just to you. Uh, contribute, how can we be part and contribute to the open science culture and movement? Go to your institutions and ask them what they are doing about it. Learn, if they are doing something, learn more about it and continue to spread the good word as open as possible, but as close as necessary. And with that, I'm so very sorry, I will have to end, um, but this is just one in a series of events that FAPES will continue promoting 
towards uh, open science and culture change. Thank you so much. And also to FAPEST staff, four people support staff who are here helping us. Thank you.